Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karen Von Hippel. It's a pleasure to welcome you here for the second presentation by Paul on what to worry about uh, in the coming year. We did one two years ago. He didn't come last year because he knew Donald Trump would be in power, <laughs> and he knew that would be beyond his capability uh, to Still predict. <laughs> uh, but it's an enormous pleasure to welcome Dr. Paul Stairs, who is at the Council of Foreign Relations in Washington. He's the director of the Center for Preventive Action. Um, he has a incredible publication history, he's over nine books that he's edited or, or authored himself. Uh, he is really, in, in my view, one of the foremost thinkers in the United States on conflict prevention, um, anticipating preventing conflict and what to do about it. Um, I won't go through all the details of his bio because I think most of you have seen it. Um, but what we'll do is Paul will present uh, the data from this year's assessment. Um, all of that will be on the record. It takes about, what, 15, 20 minutes or yep. something? Okay. And then we will open up for question and answer in the q and I'd like it to be off the record, if that's okay, with people here, because I think we can be frank. We, we didn't have a government official on the platform. I understand there are a few officials from different parts of government in the room. So if any of you want to offer some thoughts on how you look at these issues from your vantage point, that part would be off the record if anyone's up for that. And we would encourage that if possible. So, uh, and really looking forward to hearing uh, your presentation. And then also, uh, maybe at the start or at the end, you can talk a bit about how, what you've learned over the many years you've been doing this survey. So okay. without further ado, thank you. Great. Um, Thank you, Karen, for that kind uh, introduction. I hope you can all hear me. I'm a little hoarse. And I've uh, just arrived uh, from uh, the US, so I'm a little spacey from the, the jet lag. But uh, it's great to be back in, in London, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Some of you may have been here two years ago when I gave the, a similar assessment of what to, uh, what to worry about in uh, 2016, I think it is, or 2017. And, um, and so I'm going to do more or less the same thing here today, talk about this survey that we um, conduct uh, each year. We've been doing it now for 10 years, so uh, it's a pretty well-established um, methodology. I'm going to give you the kind of the, the results first, and then uh, rather than sort of bore you up front with the, how we do this and the methodology, I thought I'd leave that at the end, and we can talk about that and, and also talk about how how we've done in terms of hits and misses, what have we anticipated, what have we missed, and we can get into all of that. So what I'm going to do first is just go through our survey, and this is the front cover of the physical aspects of, of the survey. And you can go online at the Council on Foreign Relations and see it. It's a completely open document, and you can learn more about uh, how we did this. Um, let me just sort of quickly go through uh, essentially what is the survey, and, um, and we can get into, say, the more detailed methodology later. So it's a, uh, an annual survey of U.S. foreign policy experts. We send it out to around 2,000 each year. We get about 500, 600 respond respondents, so which is pretty good, statistically robust. Um, where we differ from many other kind of end of year assessments, you know, this time of the year, you, there's a lot of people who kind of uh, are asked to look ahead or give their top 10 things to worry about. We, we try to be as, uh, as reasonably rigorous as possible and not just assessing the likelihood of um, something happening in the next 12 months, but also the impact. And so it's, it's a real risk assessment. Um, and its impact through a U.S. Uh, national interest lens, although there's clearly broader um, benefits of this approach to, to other countries as well. We provide the respondents 30 contingencies, which we believe to be plausible in the next 12 months. And we do this as a result of initial crowdsourcing uh, exercise to distill uh, the inputs that we receive down to 30 plausible contingencies. Again, I can get into this further later. And then we aggregate the scores in terms of likelihood and impact, and we organize them into three tiers of relative priority. The, the, the reason being that not all risks are equally risky, and you want to focus on um, those risks that, frankly, are the most pressing, the most consequential, uh, 
uh, requiring uh, focus of, of attention and resources. So it's a fairly obvious. I think the UK does something similar with their strategic defense review, um, very much informed by that kind of uh, methodology too. By the way, if there's any questions as I'm going along, don't hesitate if that's not breaking Rusi rules. But so if you want to shout out something you're not clear about, please do. Um, so we, we give the overall generalized uh, map, and you can see the three tiers uh, in color here. I'm going to get into each of these in greater detail so you don't have to peer into the screen and figure out what's what. But that's just a sort of geographic global overview. You can kind of see, though, where in terms of where things tend to um, focus, it's kind of interesting how they divide out there. Uh, and these are the tier one priorities, and again, I will get into specifics in the middle, very much driven by major power concerns, you can see. Um, so here are the tier one priorities, and uh, as I say, you can, we can get the sense of you know, impact high, likelihood moderate, which is about an even chance the way we define it. We, by the way, we give uh, defined criteria to the respondents so they can try to uh, uh, provide some consistency across in their responses. Uh, North Korea is clearly uh, the most pressing uh, risk identified this year. It was last year's too, and it, it's been largely confirmed by what's happened in the last 12 months, but um, we're in obviously somewhat of a lull at the moment with North Korea, uh, uh, with the Olympics and the, and the uh, intra-Korean uh, dialogue that's underway, but I think there's general concern that when that, when, that uh, uh, when the, the Olympics is over, we could see a resumption of, of testing um, and a uh, resumption of this very intense uh, crisis. Um, there was some commercial satellite imagery just released showing uh, new tunneling at the main test site in North Korea, whether they're giving us a head fake, I don't know, or whether this is uh, in anticipation of renewed uh, testing. Uh, after the Olympics is uh, anybody's guess. So uh, North Korea, uh, definitely the, the number one concern this year. Uh, Russia, NATO, this Sorry, is... your likelihood figures, could you tell us what the time frame... This is next 12 months. Next 12 months. Yes. Always, always a 12-month uh, time frame. Um, Russia, NATO um, concern, this is actually distinguished from Ukraine, which is a, another con a contingency here. The possibility of uh, some kind of uh, armed clash, uh, unintended escalation, uh, leading to a major crisis between um, a NATO country and Russia. And we can talk about various places where that might seem likely, uh, whether it's the Baltics, whether it's the Kaliningrad approaches. The corridor to Kaliningrad is my favorite concern. Um, we have what we often call the um, the perennial, uh, uh, hardy perennials, a uh, disruptive cyber attack uh, on the U.S., um, along with a mass casualty attack US homeland, on the U.S. homeland. These, these appear every year. It's fairly understandable why they, they would. Obviously, the, the cyber issue has greater prominence among U.S. Uh, experts at the moment uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, mass casualty, I think here the concern, if I can in, try to interpret is the sense that there may be some sting in the tail with ISIS, that uh, we, we, we shouldn't assume that uh, ISIS is defeated. Uh, they probably saw the writing on the wall for the last uh, 12 months and may, may have made preparations to carry out some um, spectacular attack, whether in Western Europe or the US. So I think that it was the main concern there. Um, just going back on, on to the order here, Iran, clearly, this is uh, th this uh, growing rivalry competition between Saudi Arabia and other Sunni Gulf states and Iran. We're seeing it playing out in Yemen, to some extent in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, um, and even parts of uh, Afghanistan, too. Um, and here, the concern is that there would be some kind of um, direct clash between uh, Saudi Arabia and a U.S. ally in the Gulf and um, and Iran. Uh, interestingly, South China Sea, potential um, um, armed confrontation between China and uh, a, a US ally or the US itself in the South China Sea. This was somewhat surprising. 
last year, as I'll show in a minute, um, it was a tier two priority, uh, and um, it's been elevated this year, and I'm somewhat surprised by that. Uh, but I think it's, it's essentially driven by the concern that China is still um, militarizing many of these reefs and islets in the South China Sea, and uh, uh, if the larger context of US-China relations deteriorates, and people are talking about a coming trade war with China, that the uh, context of US relation with China could deteriorate and therefore make it more likely that there will be these flashpoints. But uh, so they're the, the high impact, moderate, i.e. even chance contingencies in the survey this year. Uh, in terms of impact on a moderate impact, um, uh, and, but, but high likelihood, um, Syria, uh, we're obviously entering, I think, the, uh, the end game in, in Syria at the moment. Maybe that's wishful thinking, uh, given how civil wars of this kind with proxy forces can go for 10 years or more, and we're only in, what, year six, seven? seven. Um, and so maybe um, that is wishful thinking, but uh, clearly there's this uh, intensity to the regime efforts to uh, consolidate control over as large a part of, of Syria there's also the commingling of different um, proxy forces, US and, and Russian forces, makes it incredibly volatile. So um, there is great concern that Syria could be a driver of US Russian, Saudi Iran, um, and, uh, and there's also a WMD component there as well. Um, Afghanistan, uh, expectation with the new uh, forced U.S. force deployments that when the fighting season begins in the spring, that uh, the tempo of operations will pick up there and we will see uh, increased violence there. And it's becoming a more volatile situation with the presence of ISIS uh, meddling by Russia, Iran. So I, that's how I'm interpreting that concern. Tier two, that's just this kind of overview. You can see how we kind of move down the, the global uh, chart there. Um, uh, I don't want to go through each of these in great detail. Uh, high impact, likelihood low. So East China Sea, that's the uh, Japan, um, uh, China. I think uh, relations have generally improved between the two countries over the last uh, couple of years. Abe and Xi have pretty much developed some kind of modus vivendi, and I think there's, there's, the likelihood is considered low. Mexico, interestingly, uh, came in this year. Um, the sense that I think it's a reflection of the uncertain political environment, uh, the possibility of NAFTA being um, uh, ended, and uh, that having an effect on the uh, Mexican economy, which lead to greater sort of uh, organized crime. Ukraine, uh, low likelihood. That's very surprising to me, because um, uh, there's still concern that, uh, that the situation, certainly in the Donbass, could, could deteriorate. Uh, Iraq, the situation is now very much focused on the, um, the possibility of renewed tensions between uh, Kurdistan, Kurdish forces, and uh, government forces as well as um, Shia Iran-backed militia forces and, and the, the potential for instability and, and escalation there. Israel Hezbollah, that's a new one this year. Um, again, reflecting, I think, the situation in Syria, um, Hezbollah's prominence there, the, the, um, uh, the, the sense of concern in Israel that Iran is developing this um, um, corridor, if you will, right to, to southern uh, Lebanon and the threat that that poses to uh, Israel. Uh, Pakistan, this is a you know, long-standing concern. Interestingly, I think there's the new element here actually before uh, that happened after the survey ended is the uh, decision by President Trump to end uh, or cut back at least uh, US assistance to, to Pakistan, and that might have a, an effect on the internal situation there. Israel, Palestine, here the main concern is um, uh, renewed tensions. Again, I think the, the decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital as Israel came after the survey. I may be wrong about that. Um, and then Turkey, Kurdish group. So they're the, the high impact but low probability. Um, 
uh, lower impact but high, <laughs> Venezuela, major uh, humanitarian, slow motion humanitarian crisis playing out there at the moment. Uh, we don't hear much about the migration from Venezuela, at least uh, in the US. We don't, I think, pay as much attention as we should, but it's actually quite substantial uh, in numeric terms, not quite as high as uh, Myanmar or South Sudan, but still quite significant. Um, Yemen, I don't think I have to tell uh, this audience about the situation in Men Yemen. Somalia, I think a lot of people thought that Somalia was, uh, uh, the situation was, was improving, um, but um, there's now renewed concern about uh, Al-Shabaab's um, uh, reconstitution, its ability to continue to be a disruptive influence, and then Myanmar, as I mentioned. Let me keep going here. Um, I don't want to spend too much time. Tier three, you can see, is very much uh, Africa-based, uh, with, uh, I think, uh, one exception, actually. Nigeria, um, again, uh, concerned about not just Boko Haram in the north, but uh, the Middle Belt, as well as the Delta region. Um, again, it's, it's fairly endemic there. Uh, the situation in Libya, uncertain whether the, this peace process, so-called peace process, will actually truly bring about uh, some kind of, of re uh, reconciliation and, and um, consolidation of that country. The one, uh, you should, can see the one non-African contingency here is uh, renewed tensions, maybe violence in the Balkans. Um, the various peace agreements reached during the 1990s are under uh, growing pressure and could unravel in, in a variety of ways. We've, we've just done a report, by the way. Every couple of months, we do these contingency planning studies, and we just did one on the Balkans, which obviously has implications for Europe. Sahel, Southern Sahara, again, uh, here the main concern is um, the role of ISIS and other Islamist militant groups playing a destabilizing role. A lot of these countries are quite vulnerable to, to that. South Sudan, this is the, frankly, uh, just a tragedy that really doesn't get the attention it deserves, uh, including in, in the states, frankly, given uh, the, the America's role in being the, the midwife of South Sudan. It, we've pretty, pretty much, I wouldn't say washed our hands of this, but it really doesn't get the attention it deserves. And, and we all know this is a, just a horrendous humanitarian situation. Former assistant of mine is, is working as an aid worker in the camp in northern Uganda, and she sends me pictures back. It's one, one of, the, I think, the largest um, refugee camp um, in the world is in northern Uganda. Um, DRC situation there, um, very tense with uh, question marks over whether Kabila will ever step down, and, and we've seen growing uh, um, uh, rioting and other forms of political violence. Kenya, the, the, this sort of botched election, I think, is leaving a, an overhang of, of, of instability there. Zimbabwe, don't have to tell you, uh, there, and CAR. So um, in terms of just running through what changed from this year to last year, some of these I've mentioned, uh, Iran, uh, the Iran-Saudi, Tier 1 uh, this year, Israel, Hezbollah, Tier 2, Mexico, I mentioned, Myanmar. They're all eight, eight new contingencies in total. Um, two contingencies received higher uh, ranking this year. I mentioned the South China Sea went from second tier to first tier, and uh, Al-Shabaab, interestingly, from three to two. Um, Two were downgraded this year. Um, interestingly, uh, the tensions between Turkey and various uh, um, Kurdish armed groups, um, I, I'm a little surprised about that, but uh, this was the consensus of the, the poll, um, as well as uh, Libya, and I imagine that was because of um, progress in some of the um, UN brokered uh, and EU brokered uh, peace negotiations. Um, over, t over the last couple of years, two contingencies have evolved considerably. Uh, Iraq uh, was mainly ISIS-driven, um, and now it's very much about uh, Kurdish uh, government tensions um, and the possibility of this larger conflict or 
uh, or tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran playing out in Iraq too. Syria, I mentioned, um, has evolved significantly too. Um, eight contingencies were completely dropped this year, just didn't make it. Burundi, somewhat surprising, Burundi is hardly out of the, uh, the woods, and in fact there's been recent reports in the press of the situation deteriorating there. Colombia is fairly obvious with the peace agreement. Ethiopia, maybe it was the dog that didn't bark a couple of years ago and so it was downgraded this year. EU instability, largely as a result of the immigration crisis. EU has largely weathered that, maybe not for long, but um, um, that was downgraded. Nagorno-Karabakh, this, this simmering frozen conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, received attention last year, and, um, uh, but this year was, was downgraded. So was Philippines. Um, people worried that uh, Duterte's uh, anti-crime campaign, anti-drug trafficking campaign would have some kind of political consequences. It hasn't, at least uh, not, not so far. Thailand was a result of um, uh, concern that the uh, situation might deteriorate uh, in the aftermath of the king's uh, passing, but again, uh, no signs of instability there. Turkey, uh, related to the coup, again, didn't happen. So um, each year, by the way, we also ask people to not just comment on the or assess the 30 contingencies. We also say, well, if you think there's something here that we missed or should be in there, we do. And so we, we, we have this other section called noted concerns. Uh, Colombia, people still think the, the peace process is fragile and may not... Um, um, actually succeed. Um, we get this one every year, possible confrontation with Russia in the Arctic. It, every year we get this one. Uh, it's interesting. Um, Iran, uh, this is essentially a, a, a sort of a, a clash between U.S. forces in the Persian Gulf and, um, and Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard forces. Uh, I'm surprised it didn't get into the main contingencies because or, or may, people may have thought that included it. Uh, we talked about Philippines. Egypt, I think, is definitely worth uh, worrying about um, the situation there, not just the Sinai and ISIS, but also uh, the general state of, of, of the economy, I think, is, is of concern. Qatar um, is, of, I think, well known to you. Um, this came in between this possibility of, of tensions between some of the disputed islands in the eastern Mediterranean. <laughs> some, that arose this year for some reason. Um, again, you may know more about it than I. Um, and of course, continuing sort of turbulence in the EU. Um, I'm going to wrap up now and possibly leave the, the methodology to, to your Q&A. Um, I think what is interesting here is uh, what I would call these sort of cross-cutting concerns, because each of these contingencies are playing out in the context of a larger set of issues. And um, I think, you know, if I'd been here last year, I think I, I would have said that it's absolutely very likely that uh, the Trump administration will have a major crisis in its first year. And um, virtually every administration has had to uh, deal with one. It's it's very much a uh, you know welcome to the real world situation. And uh, Trump has pretty much been lucky and has dodged uh, a major uh, crisis in this last year. So the question is, will he stay lucky? Uh, and moreover, if if we have a crisis, will it be essentially a singular event, or will it be uh, as we've also seen in the past? Um, a, a set of crises occurring simultaneously, which can be extremely stressful. The Obama had it, I think, in the summer of 2014 with Ukraine, ISIS, Ebola, um, and uh, um, extremely demanding. There's also the possibility of various uh, domestic distractions. Here I'm talking not just about um, um, midterm elections and, and um, possible democratic uh, victories in the House and regaining control of, of Congress. Uh, who knows, impeachment, 25th Amendment. Uh, Trump has a heart attack from eating too many cheeseburgers. Um, uh, and of course, stock market, you know, we're all waiting for that shoe to drop uh, any time, um, which could also be 
uh, extremely um, disruptive. Ally tensions, uncertainties, here I'm primarily talking about transatlantic uh, concerns and, and, um, and frictions, and we could, that could, there could be a variety of ways that could increase. Growing major power friction, uh, US, Russia primarily, but we could see growing tensions in, in the new year between the US and China if there is um, uh, differences over North Korea, if uh, the trade issue could could burst forth in the coming year and, and really be um, a sort of game changer in the larger context. And this is also playing out, as I said, against sort of the, the concern that various international institutions that have been the bedrock of, of global governance for the last uh, 50, 70 years are sort of weakening in the eyes of many and we're, we're unsure, frankly, how um, robust and effective they would be in a major crisis. So I'm going to end there. I'd be happy to talk about uh, other stuff, but maybe that's that's probably the best to. You sit down and take notes, and I'll okay. I'll look through the. Well, thank you very much.